Hi, Christina. How you doing? I am doing very well. I appreciate you talking to me. I absolutely love this show. I'm one of those people who is not a sports fan, so I was dragged into this show kicking and screaming and absolutely fell in love with it and can't get enough. So thank you for converting me. <laughs> Excellent. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm curious. I mean, everyone calls Ted Lasso a surprise hit, but was that really a surprise to you? I mean, deep in your heart, did you always feel like the show had potential to be a hit or were you worried that it wouldn't connect with anyone? I guess we all thought it had potential to be a, a, a little bit of a hit, but, you know, we just thought it, it, you have to believe in the show to some degree. And we did. Um but, you know, there's some shows that all of us have liked that never quite found an audience. Um, and some of them, you know, live on, you know, through streaming or whatever and, uh, and are still adored. But you just don't know where we're going to land. And so to get the response we've gotten is it, it's jaw dropping. You know, um, we're just we're just trying to make a, a, a comedy. And yet people are finding not only laughter in it, but, you know, uh, you know, Meaning, apparently. Meaning, hoy. Um, and yeah, it's it's not it's not what we were going for. It's not what we expected, and it's uh, we're just very grateful. It's one of those shows that anybody I know that tells me they're having a bad day or a bad week, I tell them, "Have you watched Ted Lasso yet?" Because you should do that, and then they always thank me. So at least it's you know serving its purpose. Oh, good. That that, that that's great. Yeah, please keep describing that, Doctor. Does the optimism of this show rub off on any cynicism you might have in your own life? I mean, a little bit to a degree. Um, you know, a big part of, of, of why Ted Lasso exists is because um, three of the creators, me and Jason and Joe Kelly, uh, lived in Amsterdam for a while. And though Ted is, you know, has what I'd call Midwestern optimism, there's also a bit of Dutch life philosophy in this as well. The Dutch have a concept that uh, I love called uh, gezelligheid. Uh, you know, things can be gezellig. Um, and like I come from Chicago, you know, child of, uh, of Irish Catholic uh, parents who, you know, uh, were able to wield guilt like a, like a Ginsu knife. Um, and then I go to Amsterdam and I find out about this thing called gezelligheid. And gezelligheid has no literal English translation. Um, it can be just like a warm sweater. Oh, gosh, it felt so good. I was gezellig and I was sitting by the fire and it was really gezellig. But it can also be, um, oh, my God, we were all hanging out and the light, it was, a, it was a, you know, it was, it was the car broke down, but but we we're all on the side of the road. But we all just got to chatting and it ended up being very gezellig. Um, and bring it back to Ted. I promise I will. Um, gezelligheid also means that if you if you're worried about a thing, but you cannot affect the likelihood of that thing to happen or not by worrying about it, then you're wasting your time by worrying about it. It does you, it does you no good. Um, and again, having been raised on guilt, like it was, you know, wheat, uh, that was an incredibly powerful concept. And I do think a big part of that is in Ted too. Like it's just, it just doesn't help you to worry about that thing. That thing's going to happen or it isn't. So uh, lighten your load. Jason has referred to season two as your Empire Strikes Back. So how do you, why do you feel that's a good description of season two? What do you think that says about season two? Oh, I shouldn't tell you this, but oh, I'm just, I'm just going to do it. Uh, Beard gets his hand cut off. Ah, oh, Rupert brings a sword and he cuts off Beard's hand. Oh. It just gets real dark. <laughs> it gets real dark. And then we have all these, you know, talking dogs, uh, you know, that fight with rocks. Oh, you got it out of me. You got it out of me. Sneaky Christina. <laughs> it's a whole new world in season two. <laughs> Called Endor, oddly enough. Yeah. Oh, wait, that's Return of the Jedi. Oh, my God, I mixed my, my Star Wars movies. Oh, no. Oh, no, the Internet's going to come for me. <laughs> but do, does it feel like it's darker at all this season? I mean, I don't know. With the first three episodes, it still feels like the... A similar tone to season one. So, I mean, do we have more things in store that I'm not expecting? I mean, I think so. But I mean, it's darker maybe than a than a sitcom is supposed to be. Um, but the thing is, like, it's really cool that people look at the show um, 
and come away with this feeling of positivity and, and, and degree of inspiration. But even in season one, it, the, season one is not all sunshine and roses. You know, it's, it's not the Teletubbies. Like people, we end up at a place of positivity after people go through some shit. Um, and cause it's about, it's about where you are after you've gone through that, as opposed to just not going through anything. So the microcosm of that is people will continue to go through stuff um, in, in season two. And you've seen some of that in the first few episodes, but there's a, there's a little bit more to come. Jason has also talked about having a very clear three season arc for the show. So if that is ultimately the case and you only have one more season left to do, has that reality set in that saying goodbye to these characters is coming a lot sooner th than you would think? <laughs> um, we're just not there yet. You know, like uh, we're, we're still we're still in post on, on season two. Um, so we cannot think that that far ahead, really. But, you know, one weird sort of sideways way I thought about it was, uh, you know, <laughs> rap parties after a season are usually, you know, really raucous, like we finished the school year kind of events. Um, but our rap party after season two was less raucous. I mean, for two reasons. One, you know, it was COVID. And uh, we're outside. There's no DJ. Um, you know, we're not we're not going nuts. But I realized later the other reason is we know we're we know we're coming back already. Most shows don't typically know that. So there was not this sort of extra gravity of uh, of, of goodbye. Will we ever see each other again? We we know we will. But having said that, at the end of season three, people are gonna cry. Oh, that rap party is gonna be a river of tears. Um, but also a DJ. So maybe that'll balance out. Do you know how the series is meant to end? I mean, obviously don't tell me because then they'd have to kill me, but do you know where it's headed to? Essentially, yes. I mean, we know we know the arcs of basically all the characters. Um, you know, once we get into the nuts and bolts of putting that season together, um, maybe the things we currently foresee will change. But um, as of now, it's just a matter of like, how do we you know thread it all together and make our sort of, you know, narrative lattice uh, of everything we picture, but basically, uh, yeah. How does Coach Beard feel about Led Tasso, and what was it like to actually see that brought to life? I mean, it was great to see because it you know harkens back to the first commercials we did when it was a different version of Ted, uh, not the gentler version that we sort of started to discover in the second commercials. Um, um, but in terms of Beard's response, I mean, it's just. You know, lead tassel is what you turn to when there's nothing else. <laughs> and so if we had to go to lead tassel, that means we're in trouble already. Um, and of course, there's the great fear that such a powerful weapon can do more damage than uh, than you want it to do. So, um, yeah, it's it's a grave, grave time whenever uh, the dark aviator shades have to come out. So I'm, I'm feeling that Empire Strikes Back vibe then. So, it, you know, to circle back to that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. See, it just creeps in all these little places. Well, it's, as much as I love these characters and each of the players on this team, they are a bit dysfunctional. So I was delighted by the addition of the doctor who's now there to help them. What do you think that adds to season two? And, and what do you enjoy about what Sarah Niles brings to the show? Uh, I mean, Sarah Niles is a rock. She's, she's just great, you know. Um, and she's actually quite, you know, quite a hoot uh, off camera, um, uh, you know, damn near bubbly. But uh, in terms of in the, in the show, you know, she's kind of a she's almost a similar foil to Roy in a, in a way uh, as Roy was in season, you know, the beginning of season one. But whereas uh, Roy was just, you know, a mirror of anger in a, in a weird way, maybe, maybe a you know, funny house mirror of anger. Um, <laughs> uh, Sharon is even more of a blank slate. You know, Sharon is is more, you know, Mount Rushmore or, uh, or Easter Island, uh, Rapanui, pardon me. Um, and she's also, you know, actively studying Ted while she's giving him nothing. And so it's just a different, different dynamic for, uh, you know, another, another hill for uh, Ted to climb. And, uh, and I think it's fun and just, I'm just so happy we got Sarah. She's she's fantastic. She did a great job this season, and I'm looking forward to everyone getting a chance to check it out. 
Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more of her and more episodes. And thank you so much for talking to me about the show. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you, Christina. Cheers.